you found us through fly fishing, you'll stay for our passion and the community. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing podcast. Yeah, but he doesn't get it. How come fly fishermen don't get it? You only haul with the short power snap. Look for where people walk and the insides of bends and hunt those. The roof blew off and the interior walls got sucked out and the trees are just coming up. And I mean, he's clearly not going to clear the trees. It is not a fly fishing story. It's a story about me trying to understand my brother through fly fishing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We've been waiting for you. Follow our guests, follow us on Instagram, and share this episode and the love if you enjoy this podcast. And we are live in three, two, one. How are you doing, Alan? I'm doing well. How are you? Good, good. Great to have you on here. We're gonna we're gonna talk uh, flight tying, which is always a fun topic. Not always the easiest thing to do on a podcast, but we're gonna we're gonna dig into it today. Uh, we're also gonna talk about the um, some of the festivals that are out there. I think you're gonna be at the Texas Festival and the Virginia Festival, so. We're going to talk about some of the stuff you're doing with Dave Whitlock's bass flies and and just generally in uh, flying in general. So before we jump into all the flight tying, I always love to bring it back into fly fishing, kind of that first memory. What, what is it for you? How how'd you get into it? So John Barrett's fly fishing the world, you know, in the early nineties there, he had on, you know, TV celebrities, Tom Brokaw, Michael Keaton, Richard Maul, uh, Kevin Costner, Liam Neeson, and, and, you know, I'm whatever, 12, 13 at the time and just. Kevin or Michael Keaton was Batman, you know, out there fly fishing. And Michael Keaton has since gone on to continue to love the sport. So is Liam Neeson. So yeah, that was, that's what got me into it. I, I started spin fishing when I was six with my dad, you know, just bluegill or where we grew up, we called him Brem, but, uh, you know, just, that was it. I, I was fell in love with the, the pretty places that it always took people. Right. 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 And you grew up in, uh, in Washington. Uh, around D.C., you know, Springfield, Fairfax, a little bit in Maryland, Mount Airy, so, yeah. Right on, and then, and where are you at now? I live in New York City. Oh, you do? Okay. So, what's your, what's keeping you busy there as far as species-wise? Locally, it's striped bass, but I travel. I mean, I just got back from uh, 10 days in Wisconsin fishing in the Driftless area, but I'll go down to visit my folks in and around D.C. still. We went for smallmouth this year. I went for snakehead and largemouth with my dad this year. You know, fishing the tidal Potomac, the upper Potomac. So nice. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. We just did an episode with the Shenandoah River Keeper, and it was, yeah, obviously the Potomac is in that, or that's in the basin, right? That that whole part of the. Yeah. The Shenandoah flows into the Potomac there at Harper's Ferry. Right. At Harper's Ferry. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. Right on. Well, we're going to, you're going to be at a couple of these festivals. I wanted to touch on this and maybe have that as a little bit of a focus to talk about what you're doing there. And one of them is, um, let's just jump into, I mean, Dave Whitlock, I, I obviously he's, you know, maybe the biggest name, you know, out there, you know, one of the biggest, um, he passed away in the last couple of years, but we had him on a while back and he's just this amazing person. You're doing Dave Whitlock's Bass Flies, um, covering this. Talk about why, what your connection is to Dave and what you're going to be tying there at the show uh, a little bit. Yeah, happy to. Uh, so Dave, you know, decided to uh, teach me his flies the last couple of years. He was alive, as many of them as we could get. We got into about 100 patterns. So that was good. He has he had over 400. So it's only a quarter of his stuff, but it was still a, a good education for me. At, you know, I've been tying for 35 years, and I'd go visit him for a week at a time. And it was like I was learning you know, going to the fly fishing show when I was 25 again, just learning that much in a, in a couple of days, but at the Virginia show there in Doswell, I'll be doing the, on the Friday of the, before the show, I'll be doing a, what we're calling the complete near enough school. So I'll be teaching people how to tie the near enough crayfish, how to tie the near enough crate, uh, sculpin as well. We'll also have a a little presentation in there about how to fish them. Cause I've tried taking people and you know, out fishing, you know, just friends or whatever. And I watched them fish a crayfish fly four inches under the surface and, you know, they'll catch some fish, but, uh, the crayfish and the sculpt, I mean, those fish live on the river bottoms, right? So it's learning to know, uh, how to get the flies down in different situations. And then also, you know, where those things live, 
Uh, and what does the sculpt, you know, the internal sculpt really imitate it? It imitates four or five different species of uh, bottom dwelling fish. Obviously, the sculpin, and there's many varieties of those, but it also imitates darters. It also imitates mad toms, stone cats, hog suckers, um, creek chubs, you know, because all of, depending upon where you live in the US, any one of those can be the main forage for the fish that are living there. You know, up in Wisconsin, they eat, a lot of the fish eat suckers. You know, we fish big sucker flies for muskie, but the smallmouth also eat the smaller suckers. So, you know, having imitations that work like that are important. Right. Wow. And when you went up to Dave, Dave's play, I mean, describe that a little bit. So you, you walk back then, what, what was that like when you, you just sat down for an hour session sort of thing or to describe that process? So the way it started was my wife bought a, a fly fishing weekend. Dave and Emily do schools or did schools. And she bought that for her and I, and halfway through Saturday, her and Emily decided to sit and drink wine bed. So Dave really just focused on me then at that point. And long story short, uh, Dave and I hit it off. Emily and I hit it off and Dave had been t trying to figure out how to teach somebody some of his fly tying techniques and what he had learned over his 70 years of doing it. And, um, you know, just if you were a fly fishing guy, you didn't have the time to, to do that. You're, you're busy on the water 250 days a year. Right. So this is what I was, it's my third time selling flies. I did it in high school and I did it after I graduated college for six years that time. And now I've been doing it five and a half years this time. So it just, it happened to, to be at the right time in my life and it was the right time for him. And we just, we hit it off. Um, so it, it, it was a really good symbiotic relationship because he wanted to make sure that, you know, his flies, you know, lived on his techniques. Um, and then also not just lived on and that one person knew it, somebody that was willing to go out and still make sure people are taught how to do it. Cause you know, and taught his way. Um, that's the other thing. Um, it was using adhesives the way he wanted them used, um, and where they need to be used, which adhesive, where all that kind of stuff. Right. Wow. So you just sat down with, with Dave and he said, okay, here's, we're going to do this fly today or the, the, these flies. And then he'd, he'd kind of tie him and you'd watch and then you'd jump on the vice. Is that how it worked? Yeah, we would do it one fly at a time. He, he sat down and all right, let's do the near enough crayfish and he'd tie it. He'd have all, everything prepped, you know, dubbing blended, the hackle claw tips, you know, pre-prepped cause it's two feathers. You know, the first thing we do to the feather is on the tip. We put a drop of super glue, the Zappa gap. That's what holds the, the feathers together. Right. And that takes 10 seconds to dry. Then he paints it with a little orange or whatever the hot spot color is going to be, but it's normally orange on a crayfish. Then to keep that paint from flaking off, we overcoat it with a little bit of Sally Hansen's hard as nails, nail polish. So he had those pre-prepped, right? So that we didn't have to uh, watch paint dry literally. Right, 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 right. But, you know, just dubbing blended materials already prepped, you know, like that. So we could, he would tie one, then he would watch me tie one. And if it was something that I didn't quite have, he would, uh, you know, there was enough stuff there for me to tie two or three more. Um, and he would, he'd sit there and watch me and, you know, help guide me if I was struggling with something, you know, my issue is always when it comes to like, when we got to the deer hair flies, he was like, oh, wow, you, you don't have trouble with deer. I was like, no, like I can get deer hair on a hook quite well. I struggle with trimming it off as an artist. I don't see the finished product inside of it. So I have to, with him, I had to sit there and, you know, tie 12 or 15 and then, you know, he would trim two or three and he could just go in and see it. And you would make the, you know, the first cut he would do after the belly cuts, he'd have the right shape for his near, you know, for the, the diver or the, you know, the frog or the wit hair bug, whatever it was. I had to learn how to, uh, you know, get to that point by doing a box first and then, you know, corner, trimming the corner off the box or, you know, those kind of things. Just because I've never been good at trimming the deer hair. Putting it on has never been a problem. But he's he helped me. You know, we we sat there and we'd figure it out together. He would try to figure out different ways of saying, try this, try that. Wow. So, wow. You had, you, had, <laughs> you had a master's. I mean, the greatest fly tying class ever, Dave Whitlock. And you guys went through 100 flies? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. For four years, I think it was. Four years. 100 flies. 25 flies a year. Every Pretty much every uh, every other week. Well, I would 
drive out there for a week at a time and we could do oh yeah two three four flies in a day yeah you know he would tie one i would tie one and and i would get and he would have examples of all right you know here's the wit hair bug and we're going to do the fruit cocktail color but he would have you know tied up sitting there this is what a porky's pet looks like this is what uh express looks like a brown bee all the different colors of it so i might hide the the porky's pet but once i see you know once i see the color pattern it substitute this color and that color and you now have a porky's pet right right gosh was um was dave um yeah you know, I, I can't remember how at the very end was was he yeah you know, i kind of asked this because my dad's going through some stuff now with like dementia and I, I was just talking to my brother about like wow what are the next few years going to look like you know it's like a slow fade yeah right to like not knowing people you know it's like wow okay this could be was dave what was that do you was that a i can't remember how when he passed away was it a um was he there the whole, the whole time at till the end absolutely he was he was just cleaning his winterizing his boat and had a had a stroke right that's right yeah it was it was not foreseen he was still you know going strong 88 or 89 89 right yeah he was up there wow well so we're going to talk about as we go to today, um, we're going to touch on some of this because I think this is you know, obviously part of what you're doing. So now at the Virginia Fly Fishing and Wine Festival, and then you also have the Texas Fly Fishing and Brew Festival, are you going to be tying, doing this session with Dave Whitlock stuff at both uh, festivals? Yeah, uh, I am, but I, I changed it up. We've changed it up a little bit for Texas. You know, it, in Virginia, it's more smallmouth, uh, largemouth in the northern half of the state aren't as popular, even though there's some really great largemouth fishing. You know, the Potomac and James River are fabulous rivers. So I kind of focused more on the smallmouth stuff, so crayfish and sculpin. In the Texas show, uh, I'm doing what we're calling Dave Whitlock bass flies from top to bottom, and I'm doing uh, one of his deer hair bugs, and then I'm doing the crayfish, the, the near enough crayfish there. So just change up the flies a little bit just to, you know, in Texas, who doesn't want to fish a deer hair bug for bass? You know, they're just more fun. Yeah. Gotcha. So, okay, Alan, and, and we got, um, and we've got this plan that we're going to be coming up here with anybody listening now. And, and I know there's some people listening around the Virginia area, around the Texas area, but if people are listening now and they want to go to the show, they can sign up. Um, Bo is uh, leading the way at the, both of these festivals, but they can go to the websites. We'll have links in the show notes to sign up for either of these festivals. And if they go there and see you at one of these, um, at your session, uh, the first 10 people, we're going to give one of these flies away, one of these um, Dave Whitlock's patterns um, or, or something uh, comparable, right? Does that sound good, Alan? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, this will be fun. So anybody listening, we'll, we'll give them a chance to give a little bonus and, and actually connect with you. And they just have to come up to you and say, hey, I, I, you know, I heard you on the Wet Fly Swing podcast and, and that'll be good enough. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, we'll we'll tuck that in in the um, in the show notes so people know how to do that. But it's really simple. Just sign up for the festival and then see you at the festival. And I'm actually hopefully going to be there. I, I'm not sure if I'm going to be at both, but I'm going to try. And uh, and I will hopefully see you there as well. So yeah. Okay. Well, let, let's keep this moving. So we've got uh, everything you have going with Dave Whitlock. Let's talk a little bit on um, a little bit on the streamers. So you're going to also be doing some streamer stuff there. Talk about that. Yeah. So I have a, a second class at both Virginia and Texas uh, on Sundays. The Virginia one is saltwater fly tying techniques. Uh, I go over just proper ways to, to put dumbbell lead eyes on, uh, stick on eyes, bead chain mm. eyes, how to do how to do a deceiver tail, how to do a key style tarpon fly tail, all of these things so that your tails don't wrap around the you know the bottom of your hook, so your eyes don't spin. Just things like that so that people can start tying more durable flies and flies that fish better. Um, there's nothing worse than having a clouser, you know, sit there and all of a sudden your eyes are just spinning on it. Right. You never know if your fly is presenting properly out there because your eyes are. So I go over how to do that and a bunch of other techniques. There's a, I think there's, I, I try to get through the 15 techniques in the hour and a half class. I normally get through like 12 or 13 if the class is full, if the class isn't quite full, I can normally get to all 15. Okay. And what are some of those? Because I know I've, I was reading some of the reviews on your Etsy site and 
I know some of the people were talking about how great the durability is of your fly. So yeah. w- what is that? Maybe talk about durability a l- little bit, some tips there, and then maybe talk about what those 12 or 15 things are that people can do here, or maybe just a few of them. Yeah. So listen, first off, I have nine adhesives on my desk that I use on, you know, on any given day or on any given fly. It's knowing which adhesive to use, which, you know, and where and why. Um, if you have a soft, flexible material, deer hair, let's say, you need a soft, flexible adhesive. You can't put a rigid adhesive in there. If you put, you know, zap a gap in with deer hair, it just makes it hard and brittle. But if you use something like Dave's Fleximent, now all of a sudden you have, you know, something that's soft bonding to something else. So that, you know, knowing those kind of things, I go over all of that in the class, which adhesives, when to use them, what are the solvents for each of them? Because listen, it, when you start playing with Zapagap, it gets everywhere. It drips and drops all over your fly tying desk. And so if you don't know that acetone clears that up, you know, it gets, takes it off your scissors. I have to soak my scissors in my ass in an acetone bath, I don't know, twice a week, three times a week, you know? 10 minutes in acetone and all the super glues, you know, gone, you know, just walk, wipe it off. So I go over things like that. You know, I keep Dave's Fleximent in two viscosities. There's a one that's almost water thin and then one that's, you know, kind of open the bottle from Rainey's and let it sit for a couple of hours just to let it thicken just a touch. And then you, you know, you have to buy the Fleximent thinner from Rainey's to, to be able to water the one down. Then I have, uh, for my light cured acrylics, I like tough fly and I, I mainly use the core and the finish. I, I have the flex. I don't use it much anymore. When I need a soft, flexible thing like that, I tend to use soft X. And then I have head cement, you know, both a thin and a thick version of that. But knowing that it, it really is just a sealant. It's not a very strong glue at all. It just seals thread wraps. And then if I need a shiny finish, I'll put a thick, you know, a real thin, thick coat on top on the top of, you know, already saturated thread wraps that gives you a nice shiny, glossy head. So I I go over that. I, um, I go over how to do an anti-foul device for your tail, for deer hair tail or uh, for saddle feather tails, like a deceiver. And that's from Drew Chacon. He's the one who showed me that. Uh, He's a fabulous tire, you know, and just the, the right way to do it. It's, you put a little bin, a little loop of mono, coming out the backside of your fly, but it, it can't be longer than the bend of the hook. If you do, it starts interfering with the tail action. Um, so it's a really small loop. It, a lot of people think, oh, let's put a big half inch loop back there. A, you don't need it that big and it interferes the, with the action and the look of your fly. But those are the things that I do for my flies. You know, when I send people to the Seychelles with GT brush flies, they always come back like our tails didn't wrap and it's because they didn't even notice it, but there was, you know, a three sixteenth inch loop of mono sitting underneath that tail that just helps prop it up, keep helps it prevent wrapping around that hook bend, you know. Then I also go on how to do uh you know, stick on eyes, whether they're dome or flat eyes, but how to get them on uh, onto a fly properly, like uh say a Murdich minnow. I've always found that those eyes tend to fall off after about two or three fish. Well, at least one does, right? So Dave Whitlock, whenever he did a deer hair fly, and I kind of adapted this technique from that, he would pre-treat the little eye socket that he would cut with some Dave's Flex Mint first. Then he would, you know, butter that area with some goop, which that's another adhesive I use, or Zappagoo or E6000 in the Midwest is used a lot, but, a you know, a vinyl or rubber cement. And then I've learned that if I pre-treat the area with flex cement, like on, like I said, on that Murdich, let that dry for five or 10 minutes. So you, you're tying a dozen or whatever, just let them dry. Then I back under the eye with the goop and I take again, a drop of that flex cement right on that fix, the thick goop and put it right where that pre-treated area was. Now I'm bonding to something that's already got a little bit of stability. And those, those eyes don't fall off nearly as often. You know, it's, it's 50, 60 small mouth before I start losing an eye, you know, and, and that, listen, do eyes matter? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. It depends upon the day. Right. But if you don't have the eye, you immediately start, start fishing that fly with less confidence. And that's, that I think is more important than anything is having confidence in your fly. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So 
and out of your fly, it looks like you tie a lot of diverse, you know, trout fly, kind of everything. Do you, do people, if they're, I mean, people call you and they have an order and you'll kind of tie whatever they want, or do you kind of have specific patterns you tie mostly? The answer is yes. <laughs> so all of the above. I do a lot of custom tying. You know, some people call it custom or bespoke tying. That's what I call it. But it's also a lot of destination tying. So I have, you know, somebody that's going to Baja, California for rooster fish and tuna and et cetera. They, they'll just call me up and say, I'm going, here's the lodge I'm going with, you know, I need flies or I need, you know, these specific flies. So I'll do that. You know, I'll, I'll build a box for them for that trip, uh, whether it's there, uh, New Zealand, you know, I, I've started doing some flies for people going for tiger fish over in Africa. That was an interesting learning process to, you know, just researching what hooks to use. It's not as simple as, oh, just use whatever hook you think. Like the hook we used for the tiger fish blew my mind how strong the, the wire had to be. So, you know, in talking to different hook manufacturers to, to learn what is the right hook, whether it's, you know, owner or gimmick or Tiemco or Daiichi or Partridge, all of those guys have to be, you know, you know, they all have different opinions of what the right hook is and then trying to figure out with guides what they want. Yeah. So if somebody comes in and they're listening, you know, now and they're thinking, hey, I'm doing this trip to Belize. I haven't been there before. And they call, they know you say they're up in New York or wherever. But, and they say, hey, Alan, I, I'm going here. You know, what do I need? Do you from there talk about that process? Do you pretty much do it all for them? Call the lodge, figure out the flies. Do, how, how do you make sure? Or is it more like they send you patterns? Like, here's what I need. That both. I will, you know, I have some people who will call up and say, you know, I, uh, I've got a lot of bonefish anglers that, you know, they have two or three patterns that they fish. They want it in two sizes, but four different weights. Right. So, cause they know that it's all about how deep is the water and that's, you know, just let me change the fly to, to sink right in that water. And, um, so they'll call me up and, and I'll do it that way. Or sometimes they're calling up and they'll say, hey, I'm going to Turks and Caicos. I've never been there before. What do I need? And, I've already called the guides down there. I know what, you know, all right, you need these, these four patterns. You need them in three different weights. And here you go. My recommendation, you know, check with the guide, make sure he's you know in agreement before we do anything. You know, with flies, you don't take returns very often. Right. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's, I will contact the, the lodge or the outfitter for you. If that's what you want. I do that a lot with some of the jungle fishing down in the Amazon and uh, Bolivia and stuff I've, I've worked with. And if I've already done that, then I know I don't need to necessarily do it again. If you're going out with Shimani Lodge, like I've sent, you know, probably a thousand flies down to that lodge. I, I know what you need. Same with the Seychelles. I've sent, I don't know, probably close to a thousand flies for people going over to there. So. Gotcha. Yeah. So you can, you pretty much, it sounds like you can, you can kind of do it all. What, what is the, like out of all the patterns you tie, do you kind of have, uh, you know, a, some top flies you tie more commonly than others? Is it more trout flies, more saltwater? Is there like a top 10 flies that you sell on your, you know, overall? Yeah. Um, let's see. The most common flies that I sell would be Lou Tabery snake in, in no order, just the ones I of Lou Tabery snake fly. They would lux near enough crayfish. They would lux near enough sculpin. I do a clouser bend back minnow. So it's looks like a clouser, but I've tied it on a bend back hook. And I added Dave Whitlock's uh, hard mono weed guard to it. The fly is, when I say weedless, it's to a different level of weed. I take it down to Southwest Florida and down through the Yucatan and in Belize, and I'll throw it three feet into the mangroves every time on purpose. So that I pull it out real slow and it just drops right at the edge of the mangrove. It's a killer fly. And it, you know, it works well there, but it's a fabulous smallmouth fly. I use it in crappie for crappie fishing. I can throw it right into, you know, a pile of Christmas trees that somebody buried, you know, it'll snake right through that lily pads, hydrilla mats. I can drag it right across a hydrilla mat and, oh, there's a pocket. Just let it drop. Right. And what's this, what's this fly called again? It's a Clouser Benback Minnow. Yeah, Benback. And, and, and how do you get it? With, how is the weed guard different that it's so good on not catching? How do you do that? It's all Dave's technique. Um, it, he has a video on it. Oh, he does. Yeah, it's uh, on Emily's website, DaveWoodlock.com. It's a uh, there's a Zappa Gap DVD about, and it tells you how to do lots of different things with it. Whether it's the the knotless leader connection, but he also goes into some fly tying that he uses with or how he uses it in fly tying. But it's essentially, I can add that weed guard to any fly once the fly is fully completed. 
he started, he found uh, Semperfly's 18 knot nano silk. And we can, we use Mason hard mono. We bend a little foot on there. We just take, you know, with four turns of that nano silk, you're back onto your head after the fly's done. Zap a gap to the thread and zap a grab that foot. And you can place it right where you want, four or five turns, get it positioned. So, you know, if it's a single weed guard, it's in line with the hook. If it's a double weed guard, it's a V with the hook point between the V, right? But that, when you do it that way, it's, you get it exactly where you need it. And you just do the zap a gap finish, whip finish on it. You know, it's not a whip finish per se, but you just butter that thread again and wrap it 10 or 12 times and then hold it for five seconds is normally enough and it's done. You don't even have to do a, a whip finish on it. It's unbelievably durable. I've never had one come undone and he hadn't either. But uh, with the clouser, normally there's that gap between the eyes that grabs stuff, you know, between the hook eye and the lead eyes. So I fill in that area to make it a wedge with tough life, which is what Bob, all, you know, if you look at his book, Flies, he talks about filling in that area back to, you know, when he first did it, he used epoxy. We don't need epoxy browns over time. So we started using light cured acrylics and I still like tough fly. So, and that's the secret to that fly. You know, it, it's just for the bend back clouser of the minnow. Yeah. And that's a pretty simple pattern, right? It's just, um, you got the body, which is ribbed in. What, what is the body wrapped in? There is no body. Oh, it's no body. You know, it's a, it's a regular clouser minnow just tied on one side of the hook only with the lead eyes right behind it. So, oh yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and what's the, what, what's the tip? What is that, that type of hook? What, what would that hook be called that you could use for that? Uh, you want to use what I call like a standard J hook or an O'Shaughnessy bend hook. That's what I like for that. I use Yamakatsu SL 11 three H Bob has his own hook by a Rex. You can use the Daiichi 2546. It's an old saltwater hook, but you know, it bends easy. The other hooks don't bend as well because they're not they're not salt water they're not stainless steel hooks. The stainless hooks bend easy, but they aren't as sharp. So it's and when I bend the SL eleven three H, you know, it took me a year and a half working with Joe to figure out how to bend them without shattering them because they're it's kind of a brittle steel, but that's why it's so strong, right? It's not and so, but he worked with me and helped me figure out how to bend them just a little because I don't need much bend. Lefty is the one who kind of turned me on to that pattern and all he said was is when you can feel when you feel the metal bend or start to bend stop that's all the more bend you need in a bend back hook it's very very little and it's it's a fabulous fly yeah that's simple right that's what's cool about it yeah it, it it's essentially a it looks like a buck an old-fashioned bucktail streamer that jigs beautifully right We've got Daniel on today from Northern Rockies Adventures. He's here to share some of the Northern BC, some fishing tips today. How are you doing, Daniel? Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, today I'd like to talk about why I love to fish for Arctic grayling. Nice. Yes. An Arctic grayling are a species that I love catching. It's been a while. Up in Alaska was the last time I was out for them. They're this amazing, beautiful, colorful fish. So tell us why you love uh, grayling. Yeah, I just can't stop fishing for them. They're they're always so keen to take a fly, um, and they put on one heck of a fight for their size. They're incredibly feisty. Um, I kind of call them our little northern uh, sailfish, um, just based off of the beautiful dorsal fin that they have. They're just an excellent fly fishing uh, species. They slurp dries. Uh, they'll go for they'll go for nymphs. Uh, even in the choppiest rivers, you'll you'll find them. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Well, we're going to be uh, following up with you, and we've got an episode with you coming up here uh, December 20th, uh, 2023. The Founders episode will be episode 540, so if anybody's listening in the future, they can check that out and get the full story. But we're going to be doing some more of these little short snippet uh, uh, intros as well. So uh, until we talk to you again, Daniel, thanks again. Thank you. Well, looking forward to it. Okay, so... So, yeah, and I think that you mentioned that. So there's, yeah, a few flies there. So it sounds like you're tying more of the uh, more of that style than your little kind of um, trout flies. Is that true? No, I sell a lot of uh, elk hair caddis. I, I tie one. Uh, it's quite durable, and it's a fabulous little, like, high mountain stream. So little brook trout here on the East Coast or go up into the high country out in the Rockies. One fly, will, you know, it'll catch 100 fish. It'll, it'll float all day. Just keep reapplying ace floating to it you know it's it's not complicated fishing when you're in those places but it's fun and you don't want to just you don't have to you know 
mess around with your fly all day trying to put frog fanny on it or something to keep it floating like you would with you know a comparadon or a parachute or something you know so I, I do a lot of those and then i do a lot of nymphs i blend my own dubbings for most of my flies um and by most i mean i can't think of one i don't i'm sure i buy something but uh so my gold ripped hairs here i tie a lot of those i blend my own hairs here dubbing it's quite spiky balanced leeches uh, for, you know, or a fabulous fly. I tie a lot of those. You know, I also do a lot of Clouser half and halves, GT eyes. How is the Clouser uh, half and half or bend back half and half different from the, um, just the bent back minnow or is it about the same? Uh, no. So the Clouser half and half is a combination of lefties deceiver and the original Clouser minnow. So it just gives you a bigger, broader profile. So, you know, Instead of looking like a, a, a thin, skinny minnow, which is what a, a clouser looks like, you get a broader profile. So it looks more like, say, a shad or an alewife or uh, a fall fish or some other, you know, taller bait. Gotcha. Uh, and, and, and you get, you know, you can find, you know, deer hair that's like unicorn level that's, you know, six inches, but not many of them. And, you know, even five inch hair is getting hard to find. So to get a clouser past three and a half, four inches, it's pretty tough. Mm, Whereas right. what that deceiver tail coming out the back, I can get a clouser half and half that's six inches all day long. You know, that's not a terribly difficult fly to accomplish. You also have, you know, a fly that's two, two and a half inches tall at that point. So, it, you know, it fits that body shape better than, you know, a, a thin little shiner or a, a sand deal or something else that's a real skinny bait. Gotcha. Wow. And, and the eyes on that, or what are they typically for the half and half? What would you be using? I still use regular old lead eyes, either Wapsie or Hairline. Those are the, the, and I tend to use red. I just, I like the, it looks a little bit more like there's something bleeding up there. Mm, yeah, it does. it does. And then, and you tie those. So how do you tie those in? So these are like um, lead eyes, not bead chain, but the same sort of thing where you wrap figure eight. Like, how do you make sure those don't spin? How, what's your tip there? So I, it all starts with, uh, Dave Whitlock's uh, Zappa Gap Foundation. So the first thing I do on almost, I'd say at least three quarters of my flies is I take a small file or an emery board or something and I scratch the hook. What I didn't know was a bronze hook, that bronze color is just paint. It's not an actual part of the hook. All right. So just give it a little bit of scratch. We're not, you know, we're not digging in and trying to, you know, defect the metal. We're just putting a little abrasion there and Put a you know, take your fingers, get the dust off, and then I take the brush on Zappa Gap, a light brush. I do a thread foundation, and now that thread foundation is bonded to the hook. So now I have a foundation that's not going to spin on the hook. Um, that's the first step. Then you know, using tight thread wraps, you you do your standard figure eights, you do your helicopter wrap, you know, up under the eyes but above the hook. That really tightens those figure eights as well. You're applying Zappa gaps throughout that process as well. Um, and when you do that, like those eyes are, I always go to the shows with, you know, four or five clousers or bend backs, whatever tied up. And I start on Friday, you know, it's Saturday at eight o'clock when they walk in, I start handing them to people like try to bend those eyes there, you know, and somewhere around Sunday afternoon, they finally break, huh. you know, 15, 20 people will sit there and and try it like their fingernails will be white trying to spin them. And they, at a certain point, what happens because I've taken razor blades to go down and figure out what happened. That first turn of thread that went over the eye will finally actually break. That's what, what fails on that when I have it tied right. And then at that point, the there's no more like, and they'll break the bond between all of those other thread wraps and the zap gap that's holding that to the foundation because the foundation is still there and hasn't turned. Right. So God, yeah, that's amazing. So the foundation, so that's what happens with all these. If you don't have that foundation, it spins basically around the hook. That's kind of the way it works. Yeah. 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 And some hooks are, you know, are polished really well. Like the Gamakatsu hooks are in that tin finish they have is very smooth. Yeah. And boy, it's hard to get your flies to not spin on that. That's a, it's interesting. Yeah. A bonefish gotcha or a crazy Charlie or whatever it is. They're all really difficult. Uh, on that hook because it's such a smooth finish. So, yeah, it seems like one thing the the companies could do is just make a 
non-smooth finish on top of the fly, right, where you're tying the materials. That might be one way to, is that something, you know, that might be a possibility? Well, you know, there are some hooks that are better at that, like the the Daiichi 2546 is stainless steel, so it's not terribly smooth. It bonding surface naturally, but the that smooth finish is what gives it that like mirror finish, right? And that's what helps make that hook a little bit more invisible in the water. It, it reflects the colors around it, so it reflects the bucktail or the sheep hair or whatever you might have around it. Yeah, right. Wow. Well, I, I want to take us into uh, back into the show and talk about some more of these flies. Um, before we get there, I just wanted to, we had a listener question. This was from uh, Joseph Armstrong. I'm just curious. This is more of a, a beginner question, but I, I'd like to get your take on it. Um, Joseph said um, he's been thinking about getting into tying, right? Flies. He hasn't done it yet. He's not entirely sure where to start. It's kind of price. He says it's kind of a pricey investment to acquire all the necessary stuff, but I think it could be a nice hobby to do in my free time. So he's wondering, you know, basically he says, is it actually worth investing in a whole setup? So what do you tell somebody that's listening that hasn't started? And I know a lot of people are already tying, but for that new person, what do you tell them? Because it seems overwhelming, right? God, all this money, all these materials, where do you start? A, it is. And B, if you think it's going to save you money, it's not. You're going to buy more fly tying materials than you had flies and rods and reels and lines combined. Right. But if you enjoy that process of creating your own fly and catching a fish on it. Like I, I don't fish anybody else's flies, but mine. And, you know, unless it was, you know, one that Dave gave me or somebody else like that gave me, you know, Chuck Resniak from Eastern Trophy. He, he ties a beautiful cork bug. I'll fish his, but I don't tie other people. I don't fish other people's flies. Right. So that has to be one of the the deals for you. And the other thing I'll say is don't buy cheap equipment, buy a really good, quality vice, buy a Dyna King vice or, or a Renzetti vice, like just bite the bullet, spend the money. Cause also with those, their, their resale value isn't horrible. You can get like 50% of the, what you paid for it back, just selling it on eBay or something or set up shop, do it on consignment for you. Right. 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 So it's worth, yeah, it's worth instead of getting the cheap vice. What about the materials? Do you recommend, you know, if somebody's just getting started, go buy a bunch of materials or get a package or what, what, how do you start there? I've always said, talk to your, you know, make sure you're buying from your local fly shop. You don't want to do mail order at the beginning. Uh, you need to be able to pull the bucktail out, look at it or pull the dubbing out and look at it or whatever it is and make sure it's what you want. And you don't know what you want. No, that's the problem. Yeah. You don't know what you want. Fly shop will help you if in, when you're there in person, they're happy to do it. Yeah. Yeah, that would be one good. Yeah, definitely. If you have a fly shop locally, getting a um, yeah, getting a lesson right. That's one definitely always a good recommendation. Absolutely, and a lot of fly shops do. You know, it's, we're in the time of year where they're going to start doing beginning fly tying classes. Um, I do them. Um, I do you know more advanced classes across the USA. I'm going to be doing Wisconsin and Georgia and uh, Alabama and here in New York. And do you do those? Are you doing those by Zoom or in person? I do both. Go to the fly shops. I'm working on a couple of fly shops right now. We're just trying to nail down some dates, you know, one for March. I've got a couple here in the New York local area that I'm working on, you know, just trying to figure out, you know, does this weekend work? Does that weekend work? That kind of stuff. So, but, you know, I tend to do, you know, more advanced patterns. I'm going to do uh, a Dave's, one of Dave's patterns, or I'm going to do, I do a class on how to fortify your flies and make them more durable. Um, so I'll do that class at one of these. You know, every shop is looking for something different. So, because they know their yeah, they know their people. And listen, I would love to teach everybody the near enough crayfish. I think it's hands down one of the most effective flies I've ever fished. I've caught so many different species on it: permit, bonefish, snook. Uh, then we go, you know, in freshwater we've got uh, largemouth, smallmouth, crappie, bluegill, carp. You know, you, you name it. You just change its color to match the bottom, and um, it works. It's, it's incredibly effective, but not everybody wants to, to learn it or, or wants to tie it. So, right. Right. And if they want to learn, like we said, you're going to be tying that one at, uh, at the Virginia festival and Texas and Texas both. Yeah. And I forgot to mention this before anybody that shows up to my class at either of these festivals, they get a one-year membership to Trout Unlimited. And if they're already a member, they get a one-year extension. And then also with each class, they get a fly tied by me 
for each of the patterns that we're going to learn that they can take home as a reference fly as well. That's as, as exacting a copy as, as anybody can do to one of Dave's down to, you know, the sculpt and I paint with all four colors of the paint he wants on the eye. And then the other thing is, uh, they'll also get, I tried, you know, taking back a, a bottle of Zappagap that everybody was using in the class that didn't work. So everybody just gets the bottle of Zappagap at, at the end of the class as well. Okay. Yeah. So, so the class, and let's talk about that a little bit. So the class, let's go to Virginia. So the thing you're doing Friday, I guess the show, talk about that. So the show starts on, um, let's say I don't have the dates in front of me, January 13th and 14th, right? Yeah. On Saturday, I do a show. I have a class on Friday at the hotel ahead of time. It's that class is the Dave Whitlock Near Enough School. We're going to go over the Near Enough Sculpin, the Near Enough Crayfish, all the different ways, the color patterns of it, how to paint the eyes. We're not going to paint the eyes. I'll have them already pre-painted for everybody. We'll just, you know, I'll, I'll go over how to do it, but we don't need to watch paint dry, oh, right? Yeah, so at this thing, this is literally a tiny yes. People are going to come here Friday and they're going to tie, sit down behind a vice. Oh, yeah, yeah, and it's a long class. It's, uh, it's either four or six hours, I forget. It's a long time, you know, it's not a, it's not a, a beginner's level class, but we're going to, we're going to dive into how to tie those flies, how to blend the dubbings, what materials you can use for each fly and, you know, multiple substitutions of each of those. Cause you might not be able to play your shop might not carry Ewing hackle. They might have whiting hackle. So I have, you know, both of those of what can be used. Or maybe you need, uh, you know, Something else, you know, if, if you can't get Wopsy dubbing, if they have hairline, I have, a, you know, what you can use for hairline dubbings to to blend and make the right colors as well. And then it's, yeah, I mean, six hours. So you're going to be in that period of time, probably just, yeah, answering all sorts of questions around just fly tying in general too, right? This is, yeah, yeah, whatever comes up. And in that class, because these flies need a weed guard, we'll be doing the weed guard. We'll be, we go through the entire process. He also does, on most of his flies, he did something called the hard mono foundation, and we'll be, we'll be showing that. And that's, um, after you scratch the hook, lay that first drop of Zappa gap down and do your thread, your first initial thread base. The next thing we do is we take Mason hard mono and we lash two pieces to each side of the hook shank. So now we have a flat platform to tie on. And if you think about normal fly tying technique, you have round thread and you have round materials that you're trying to attach to a round hook. And they always end up spinning or moving on you, right? We all have different methods and techniques of trying to prevent that, whether it's a pinch technique or, you know, a rolling thread torque technique. We've, we're trying to always compensate for that. What Dave figured out is if he does this flat platform, now and I'm not, I have a round material, but I'm tying it to something flat. So it, it doesn't move on me very much. Um, and it really changes what you can do on a hook. And then it also, dramatically increases its durability. That was the thing that I learned that I wasn't expecting because now I'm, I've more than quadrupled the bonding surface I have when I'm using an adhesive. I'm not trying to bond to just a hook shank. I have this big, you know, essentially three hook shanks wide piece of flat, you know, of, of a flatter area that I'm bonding to. Um, so your flies just become tremendously more durable, which was a, I didn't expect to, discover that when I was learning the, the techniques. Right. Wow. I'm looking at, I'm now on the page. I'm just looking for folks on the, if you want to buy a ticket to this, this is on the Virginia uh, Fly Fishing Festival page. And it actually has your class here, the Complete Near Enough Tying School, and um, talks a little bit about the details. And I guess it's only 12 students. I'm not sure if this will change, but is that right? Yeah. I can only teach 12 on that class. The deer hair class in Texas, I've maxed out at 10 just because- Okay. Deer hair requires, uh, if people aren't used to working with deer hair, they get overwhelmed and they get, they're afraid of messing up. Yeah, this is cool. Chris Helm taught me how to tie deer hair the first time. And I, his first technique that we always did was he would just have you spin deer hair on a hook and just keep pulling until you literally slice it. And we would do that three or four times at the beginning of every morning he would do that. And he goes, great. Now you know how hard you can pull. You just figured it out four times in a row. So I've learned that when I teach a deer hair class, if I get them to do that, it kind of, sometimes that'll get them over that, that hump of being afraid of pulling too hard or not pulling hard enough because we're, we're just going to ruin three spins right away. So that, that helps a lot of people, but yeah, we'll, uh, 
but in all of those all those classes um they get the a fly you know that matches the the one we're tying from me the the tu membership and a bottle of zap and then uh on Sundays, I'm doing the the streamer fly tying class, and for that, they still get a, a bottle of Zappagap and a TU membership. But we're not doing a specific pattern in those, so they, mm, they don't. Fly. I see, I see. So, so Virginia, yeah, you're doing the near enough sculpin, and you're doing the near enough crayfish, and then remind us again at Texas, you're going to be doing um, different patterns for that Friday session. Yep, in in Texas, we're going to be doing Dave Whitlock's bullethead waking minnow, and then a sculpin. Oh, I'm sorry, the near enough crayfish. Okay. Good, good, good. Yeah. And so the dates are, yeah. So Friday, January 12th. Uh, cool. So yeah, this is definitely some FOMO, you know, if you're, <laughs> if you're missing out here, there's only 12 spots available. So um, I'm sure that's going to go quick once it's, uh, once it's going. But yeah. Nice. The class at it, both uh, Virginia show and the Texas show last year sold out. So I'm, hopefully they sell out again, but it's more of a, I, I just, I can't do more people in that and still have enough attention to make sure everybody is learning what learn and it's not taking you know 40 minutes between techniques or before the next step we kind of have to keep things moving a little bit to keep people how do you like this it sounds like you've done both how do you when you compare the the in-person like this that you're doing here versus say the zoom stuff you might do trying to teach it talk about that is there a big difference there can you do equal no it's not equal the zoom isn't quite as good unless the other person is uh technologically savvy um, which they normally aren't. So if, if I can get them to take their camera and turn it on their fly for me so that I can see what they're doing, see them. That's the key. How they have it set up so that I can see them. And it's like, great, but I can't see the fly. Like I, Oh yeah. They're willing to do that. I can really help them with whatever the technique is. You know, I've had some people call up and say, Hey, listen, I just need to learn how to tie, you know, this bonefish fly or this fly. So we'll, we'll do a class just on that. Sometimes I send the materials out if they want. Sometimes I don't. If they want to buy their own, it's you know it's it's personal preference. How much are they looking to spend on the class? But you know, if I send the materials, I know that they're the right material as well, because um, I'm going to make sure that it's the right material for that fly for that pattern. Yeah, and that's some of the stuff they'll be learning is like getting the right material, choosing materials. How do you all that? Yes. Yeah, and that's that's a big part of both the classes at the Virginia and Texas show is, is going over material selection. You know, I'm not doing this fly this year, but you know, Dave Whitlock's Matuka Sculpin, it's a beautiful fly. And one of the reasons why it's beautiful is, is the entire Matuka feathers that he used, they're always Cree. Well, nobody has that many Cree feathers hanging around. Right. So, but as I've, I've been over there helping Emily inventory his materials, he had 26 Cree necks. <laughs> so, you know, that's why he could do that. So I've had to find other options for when I try to teach patterns that, you know, I can't, he used Cree, uh, Cree schloppen feathers for the near enough crayfish for the legs on it. Again, nobody has Cree schloppen. So working with him to get that fly right took me a year and a half. It wasn't that I wasn't tying the fly right. It was finding materials that were acceptable, that gave the finished product the right look. That was the really hard part. Because it's it like I said, he would take Cree schlop and dye it olive, and that's what he used on his olive near enough crayfish for the the spiraled hackle legs. Like, yeah, wow. Not commercially available for anybody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. It's a, and we're like with Dave's stuff. You know, if somebody wanted to learn, you know, like you talk about the hundred flies, he's got a lot of flies. Where where would somebody go to kind of learn more about his style of fly tying and what he has going? Well, he has, um, I think it's five or six DVDs that he, okay. that Emily sells on daywoodlock.com and they're, they're fabulous. And, you know, over the years, the interesting thing I learned as I was going through his studio after he passed is he had an evolution to his flies. And we all know if we, going back to that Matuka Sculpin, it all started as a, as a flat wing, Right it started off it as a comp like kind of like a spudler then he turned it into a matuka wing right but there was more evolution to all of his flies he had um he did a sheep shad you know series of streamers called the sheep minnow series but he had a shad version of it and he i found in his desk drawer once 
uh, out west they'll they'll peg those little orange plastic beads you know a couple inch hook you know this time of year normally right well he said well i like that little orangish red color and he literally just shoved that thing around the hook and instead of using his red gill dubbing he tried that for dubbing you know for the red gills just to see what would happen like he was always trying different things to see if he can make the fly better right Gosh. And, and you have, well, let, let's talk about that. Just on Dave, you, you've thrown out, you know, tossed out a lot of tips today, but if you think about some of the biggest kind of lessons, tips you learned from Dave, could you summarize a few of those just maybe high level, like what people can, you know, expect or what you learned from him? Yeah. The most important thing I learned from him was to keep an open mind to a new idea and be curious about that new idea. One of the biggest mistakes I made when I first met him was he asked me on the very first day I showed up what I thought of weed guards. And I grew up with weed guards that came around the bend of a bass bug hook, you know, and they were super hard, heavy monofilament. Yeah. yeah. Bass ponds catching 14 inch largemouth as a kid. I wasn't catching four and five pound largemouth. So they were really good fish prevention devices back then. Like I get <laughs> the never catch a fish. Right. If they were just too small to deflect that super so over the how he figured out, you know, better methods for it, but he did not like that. He was upset. The next day I showed up and instead of tying, Emily handed me a box of flies from Dave and said, we need you to go fish these now. In your first 30 casts, you have to throw the fly three feet on the bank. So I did. And I never went to go get my fly. I learned to like weed guards that day. And the weed guard is mainly how, how Dave tied it. Um, how you tie it is, is just a, th a much thinner, or maybe talk about that. How is it different than that thick, you know, big bass bug weed guard? So it, it's, it still might be that if I'm doing a big, heavy deer hair bug, you know, or something like that, but it's, he stopped doing the big loop. It's now just a, a foot and he ties it so that it's always short of the hook point. So at no point is it ever hook element fish's mouth. Like that doesn't happen. So that could happen before with that big loop, right? And it deflects out of the way. You have to learn the the right strength of monofilament to use. So I have everything from eight pound to eighty pound Mason hard mono sitting at my desk. I'm looking at it right now. I've whatever it is, ten or twelve spools of of Mason hard mono, because each fly needs a different strength mono for the weed guard. Um, I'm only trying to deflect the weight, the natural weight of that fly. Um, that's all the stronger it has to be. And if you make it too strong, now you start preventing hookups. So, but it's just a little single foot weed guard that's tied in short and it's on his DVDs. It was, a, uh, I know at least it's on his deer hair bugs. I'm um, trying to think if he, and I think he does it also on his, uh, yeah, he does it on the hopper too, the Dave's hopper. He shows another way to do it because that way he shows just using straight zap -a gap instead of using thread. Yeah, Dave's Hopper. So that, that's the thing about Dave. I mean, obviously Dave Whitlock is, you know, Dave Whitlock, but the Dave's Hopper is one. I mean, that's, what do you think is his most famous well-known? It seems like the Dave's Hopper is one, I mean, just because it's trout, I guess. But what, what yeah. other, yeah. Listen, I, I think it's a it's a toss-up between the Dave's Hopper and the Matuka Sculpin, in my opinion. Because even going back, like Kelly Gallup's always said that he was trying to create a, a faster fly than a faster fly to tie than Dave's Matuka Sculpin. And he was trying to do the zoo cougar and stuff. He's like, it's the perfect imitation of the Sculpin. It just took too long to tie. So he wanted to try to come up with a simpler version of it, of that deer hair head. And so that's what he's trying to do. So, you know, there's some heritage there. Uh, the only other fly that I think is, you know, up there is e either his wit hair bug or the diving frog. If you're a warm water angler and you like fishing deer hair bugs, it's hard to choose a wrong one when you're choosing one of those two. Yeah. And what about the, is that like the Vortex, Whitlock's Vortex Diver? That's, that's a different one. The Vortex Diver, I, I tie a fair number of those and I love fishing them. It's, you know, it's his version of a kind of a Dahlberg diver, but he changed it up. The diving frog is just that it's meant to act and fish like a, a frog does, but you know, around lily pads or. We, you know, or something, you know, and then the wit hair bug is just a, a deer hair popping bug, but it's, I kind of think it was the first one that was commercially available and was tied well and fished well. So that's why it's, 
it's still so popular today is it, it just has that heritage. It's been available for remember 30, 40 years now. Commer- you know, tied overseas, commercially available and tied well. Right. Yep. Man. Yeah, there's so much. I think, um, you know, with Dave and with what you have going, there's, it's like, a, I feel like he, Dave did a pretty good job of leaving like he wanted to do, right? Leave a, a process or a trail so people could follow what he did for years to come. Do you feel like that's all out there? People in uh, 50 years from now will still be able to look back and be like, oh, here's, here's how Dave did it. Here's the unique. What's your take on that? Listen, we're, we're trying hard to make sure that that happens. So one of the things I'm doing as well as, you know, doing these shows where I'm getting paid for these classes, right? I'm going to be paid class that I do. I, I'm donating one class essentially. So I've got a, a program. I think the first one's in mid November with project healing waters. So I'm going to be doing an online session with them where any one of their members for project healing waters can log into the, I think we're doing Facebook live the first time, but they may be changing that. And I'm going to be doing the, you know, the near enough sculpt or the near enough crayfish or the you know, a wit hair bug or the fox squirrel nymph for, you know, whatever the pattern might be. And I'm going to teach them how to tie it as well and donate that. So, you know, for every paid one, I'm, there will be a, a free one available to some organization that needs it. And I'm starting with Project Healing Waters because they've just always been a good group of guys and gals for me, you know? Yep. They're, they're another great group. And yeah, and Dave, of course, also had some of the art, right? Did you guys ever talk about that or when you're around him, see some of his, was he still doing art later towards in his life? That's, that's what he focused on the last 10 or 15 years of his life, way more than the fly tying. He started doing a lot more of the art, you know, as I, as I'm sitting there tying flies, like if I'm just sitting there spinning deer hair on the hook, like he didn't bother to watch me do that. He'd go over there and work on a piece of art. And then when I was done trimming, he'd come up, I'd bring it over to me. He's like, all right, let's work here, do that. You know, he would, or he'd go, no, that's good. Same with, you know, the fox squirrel nymphs. He, he showed me how to tie one of those and he'd walk over and finish the art. And I remember I was, I was tying one, brought it over. He's like, yeah, your body's too skinny. Do it. So I'd go tie another one. All right. That looks good. You know, like I, when I tied my body too skinny, <laughs> man, that's so, it's so amazing. You had that, that, that all came together. It's, it's really funny too, because of the wine, right? You got these, the Virginia wine festival and, and your wives, you know, they met, you had the wine, you know, session there and yeah, that's perfect. It worked out well. Cool. Well, let, let's do a quick little rapid fire out of here and we'll, we'll take us out of here. And this is obviously today kind of, this is all presented by, um, like we said, you know, the Virginia and Texas festivals. We're hoping people, you know, there's a lot of people listening now that aren't in that, those areas probably won't be going. But I think that with what Bo has going, I, I feel like there's some opportunities to do some more stuff around the country. And uh, and I'm hopeful, you know, us working together, we're going to come up, like you said, just like Dave, always think differently, right? Kind of how can you change it? So, um, but but let's let's just, um, you know, you mentioned a vice, Dyna King, and that's come up a number of times. I love Dyna King. That's one of my vices I've tied lots of flies on. So is Dyna King, do you just use one vice? What is the model? Do you, do you kind of, or do you have more than one vice? What do you have like a show, th- something you take on the road or is it, how's that look? So I tie on two vices mainly. I have a Dyna King indexer, which they have technically discontinued. They just started selling vices again. They were bought in February. Yeah. By the Mayfly group, I think the airflow and that crew. Yep. Yeah, and, um, they discontinued that one, but they're keeping the the next level above it, which is called the ultimate indexer. They're just, I don't have the ultimate. I never thought I needed that. It has one more function that I don't use. And the way I always say it is, is nothing holds a hook like the Dyna King, like absolutely nothing. I, at every show, I take a box of Gamakatsu's SC15 and 2 watt with me. And anytime people go, oh, why do you like that vice? I put a hook in that, that hook in the vice and I can just bend that hook right open and break it. Oh, wow. Yeah, nothing else can do that. No kidding. Um, but yeah, I don't like it for smaller hooks. I have to switch out to the midge jaws that take, you know, two minutes to do. And in that time I can, you know, undo my vice stem holder and I drop in a Renzetti Master Vice. That was actually David Emily's wedding present. Oh wow. Find out. Yeah. David never tied a fly on it and didn't. He still tied on the the prototype that Andy Renzetti gave him whatever, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, whatever, however it was, that's the vice he tied onto the forever. 
and it was sitting on the shelf. And I was like, Dave, are you ever going to use it? And he's like, no. I was like, well, can I have it for, yeah, you know, I gave him a couple hundred bucks for it. And, and it was really interesting. It's serial number is zero, zero four. Huh? And I was like, so who got, and I was thinking forever, who got one, two, and three. I was like, all right, Bob Clouser, maybe Lefty Cray got one and two. Yeah. <laughs> Figure out who got three. And then uh, I was talking to Lily not too long ago and she, she finally told me Renzetti had kept one, two, and three. Oh, there you go. Whatever given out. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And we had uh, Lily on in episode 486. It was a really awesome episode. I listened to. Oh, you hear that? Yeah. You heard that one. Yeah. She, she's awesome. Told a really great story. Good. Okay. And then what is your vice? So that's your vice tying. And what is your vice? I always love hearing a little bit more on the personal stuff. Do you have anything, you know, kind of the vices more on the things that maybe aren't that healthy for you that you have either partaken now or had to uh, get rid of um, sort of thing? I always think of like the, the, the alcohol, and the smoking, anything like that in your fast. What's your vice? For me, it's New York City pizza. Oh, pizza. Yeah. In a bad week, I can go through, you know, 12 or 14 slices. Oh man. I love pizza. What's the New York pizza? Is it just the thin, greasy, awesome pepperoni and cheese? Yeah, just the salty cheese. And, yeah, you know, if you hold it just right, you can drain off about two tablespoons of grease. Right. And you have that versus the always the versus the Boston stuff, right? Which is the thick, sort of different. Have you, are you, do you have all the pizza or is it just New York style? Listen, I like pizza in general, but there's, you know, I, I was away for 14 days. I was just visiting Ewing Hackle and fishing for 11 days. And I came back and that night I went and got pizza. I know. I know. It's pizza is the best. Okay. So that, that is actually a great vice. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. And, and like everything, right. With these things, you kind of in moderation, otherwise you're probably going to have to quit at some point in your life. Yeah. No I'm, I'm point. It, it's, it's now a, I try to, you know, have a couple slices a month now. It's just, it stinks having to limit yourself. I know. There you go. Okay. And what about, uh, so uh, let's talk one fly, one species. So if you're going out anywhere in the world, the country, you know, do you have that one favorite species? Sure. I mean, what time of year? Yeah. Let, let's just say right now it's uh, mid, it's mid October. So the smallmouth fishing is normally pretty slow right now. So I'd go back to trout. Yeah. So trout, like brook trout, whatever's available. But if I had one species and I can pick the time of year, it's smallmouth bass in the summertime and top water flies whether it's a, a deer bug or a cork bug it's going to be one of those two yeah yeah so top water awesome okay and uh and then we're so obviously we're in the beer and wine festival are you are you more of a beer or wine drinker or or, or either or neither both sound fabulous yeah yeah so what's your what's your do you have a wine or a beer of choice type or my wife's british so i like warm british brown beer you know and oh good. yeah it's fabulous to me and always has been I've always liked that. And then I like a good Spanish Rioja or Riviera. This is wine? Yeah. And this is, would to say that again, Spanish what? Uh, Rioja or Riviera del Duero. Okay, Riviera. Okay. <laughs> we'll try to track that down. I've always, wine choices or selecting good wine is not easy, it seems like, right? It's, are you like a master at uh, selecting a good bottle of wine? No, that's my wife. Oh, that's your wife. Yeah. Wow. You've got, that's good. That's good to have that though. So, yeah. Nice. Okay. Well, and finally, just looking again, as we head out of here, the show, do you, when you do your sessions, are you, you must be like most of the featured speakers just going, do you, do you have a chance to look around and be like on Saturday, Sunday, and just appreciate what's going on? Describe that a little bit like this show. Yeah. Let's say you take Virginia. What, what is that? What could somebody expect? What, what is that like? Oh, the show is fabulous. And there's a lot of really good tires there. You know, Steve Maldonado's there. William Perezniak's always there from Eastern Trophies. Yep. Tom Rosenbauer is going to be there, I believe. Yep. Tom shows up. I think one of the best casting instructors in the United States is there, Mac Brown. Oh, Mac Brown. He's unbelievable. Last year, I took his casting class. It was a four, six-hour class. And he was trying to show me something, and his back cast kept hitting something up in the, the top of the rafters. So he got down on his knees and shot into his backing on his first cast. Wow. <laughs> he yeah. did put back cast, and boom, all... And it went, I was like, oh, that's How a do you do that? casting skill. God, that's great. Yeah. He's fabulous. And then, you know, there's a bunch of destinations there, whether it's, you know, the jungles of Amazon or Alaska. Uh, Fishing, spring creeks, yeah, all sorts of stuff. Florida guides. You know, there, there's a bunch of that stuff there. Uh, there's some 
nonprofits there, you know, Project Healing Waters has a booth and they've always got something going on where, you know, they're trying to get help for an outing or, a, you know, a rod building class or a fly tying class. You know, they, they've always got stuff going on. And, you know, there's fly shops, Mossy Creek fly shops always there. They're a good bunch of guys. Yeah. I was going to say Colby. Yeah. We're doing a little event with Colby actually right now, um, getting set up for next year. So we're going to be out there fishing probably some brook trout streams next year. Yeah. You'll love it. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm yeah. excited. I think we're going to be, I haven't been to that area. So I think, uh, Shenandoah, you hear so much about it, you know, uh, and so that'll be fun. Good. Well, this I think is going to be a great event. I think if people want to connect with you, um, you know, they're going to probably fly on the water.com is probably the best place. Um, or like we said, if they go right to, uh, one of these events at the the festival, they can get a, get some fly patterns from you directly. But yeah, Alan, anything else before we head out of here? I know we've like a lot of times we kind of hit the surface on a lot of this stuff, but, um, any other takeaways on fly tying or any other, uh, things you want to tell folks listening now? Just, you know, if you want to learn, go to your local fly shop, contact commercial tires that, you know, professional tires that do classes. Not all of us do. We all want to teach. Like that's the funnest part of our job. So we all want to help if we can. Right. And who's your local fly shop? Who's your closest fly shop to you or the one you go to? Uh, Urban Angler. Oh, Urban Angler. Yeah. It's a good little shop. It's they have really good rod selection. Right on. All right, Alan. Well, uh, yeah, definitely appreciate you for coming on today and shedding some light on some fly tying tips. And obviously the Dave Whitlock was awesome to hear that. I think I'm going to continue to be focusing on kind of Dave's history and, and, and all of that. So, um, so yeah, until we see, hopefully uh, you at the show, uh, have a good rest of the year and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. That is a wrap. You can grab all of the show notes at wetflyswing.com. And please follow us on Instagram and share this episode out with someone you love. Please send me an email, dave at wetflyswing.com if you have any feedback or want us to put together an episode on this podcast for you. Check in anytime. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and would love to meet up with you on the water. We have new fly fishing schools going all year long and all around the country. So if you want to connect, let's do it right now. All right, time to get out of here. I hope you have a great evening. I hope you have a great morning or great afternoon wherever in the world you are. And I appreciate you for stopping by and checking out the show today. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.